So I wonder if people could start uh, taking their seats so we can start the session. Okay, so welcome to this uh, second session of today's workshop. Um, we're going to have two contributed uh, talks and then an invited speaker. Um, so uh, for the benefit of the contributed speakers, I'm going to wave at you furiously at 15 minutes, which means you've got two minutes left. Um, so let's get straight started. Uh, the first um, talk is uh, called um, Cross-Lingual Transfer Learning for Multilingual Task-Oriented Dialogue and uh, the papers to be given by Sebastian Schuster uh, from Stanford. Thank you. Yeah, um, good morning, everyone. I'm Sebastian, and I am presenting today work that I've done as part of the Facebook Conversational AI team this summer on cross-lingual transfer learning for task-oriented dialogue. So fortunately, the previous speaker already talked a bit about the standard conversational AI pipeline, but just to briefly review it. So when you use a conversational AI system and you issue a command such as set a reminder to repark my car tomorrow at 7 p.m., then usually the first component is uh, some ASR system that transcribes that utterance. Oops. Um, then the second component is usually um, some component that tries to detect the intent that a user had when making that utterance. And then the third component is usually um, to figure out what are the slots for that given intent, so what are the arguments that are needed to execute that intent. And then there are usually a bunch of more things, but in this talk, we're gonna focus on these two components, intent detection and slot filling. So just that we're on the same page, assuming we have a command like this one, then the task of intent detection is just a sentence classification task. So in this case, the classifier would ideally figure out that this is a set reminder intent. And the task of um, actually filling the slots is um, a sequence labeling task. So um, ideally, um, some model would figure out that repark my car, in this case, is the to-do, and tomorrow at 7 p.m. is the date time. And so one class of models that has been really successful for this kind of task are these um, bioless CMCRF models, where you first embed um, the tokens, then you run them through a bioless DM, um, you use that bioless DM layer to predict the intent, and um, then you pass the output of that bioless DM layer through a CRF layer um, to assign tags to each word which correspond to the slots. So these models work really well when you have large amounts of training data. So um, give, like often per domain, that means like several 10,000 utterances annotated with data, uh, annotated. But at the same time, um, there are around 6,500 languages spoken around the world. So even if you just wanna like deploy these systems to 1% in, of these spoken languages, um, this would be very expensive and time consuming. And so, um, as part of this work, um, we were looking at how can we actually improve models in a low resource language by exploiting data in an existing high resource language. And um, so that work mainly consists of two parts. First, we collected this novel multilingual data set, which I'm gonna talk about in a second. And then um, we evaluated three cross-lingual transfer methods. Two of them um, had been proposed before. So one is to automatically translate the training data Second one is to use these cross-lingual embeddings. Um, and then we're gonna present a new method of using cross-lingual contextual um, word representations. So um, 
We collected the data for three domains in total. Uh, one is the alarm domain, which contains utterances such as set an alarm for 7 a.m. The second domain is the reminder domain, which contains utterances such as remind me to repark my car tomorrow at 7 p.m. And the third one is the weather domain um, with questions such as how warm is it going to be in Montreal tomorrow afternoon. So um, we collected utterances for three languages where English sort of served as the high resource language and then we had Spanish and Thai as the low resource languages. So for English we had a total of around 43,000 utterances. For Spanish um, we had around 8,000 and for Thai with around 5,000. And crucially, um, like all of these were annotated according to exact the same annotation guidelines so that um, transfer learning would be possible. Um, and as you can see, so I, I show here the splits of the data. So um, for English, we have most of the data in the training set, but for the other two languages, we actually have most of it in the test set so that we get reasonable estimates of how well our methods work. And kind of to make the task even more challenging and having fewer examples in the training data. So um, let me briefly talk about the three transfer methods that we tried. So the first one was um, this method of you translating the data in the high resource language um, to the low resource language and then projecting the slot annotations via alignments. So if we have a sentence like how warm is it going to be in Montreal? tomorrow afternoon, the, and you want to translate this to German here, um, wie warm wird es morgen Nachmittag in Montreal, um, then you can automatically translate that using a machine translation system. From that system, you get some form of alignment. For example, we use the attention weights to get that alignment. And then um, using that alignment, you can project the annotations to the target language. Um, and then basically you have a new data set in a, in a new language. Um, and crucially, that also can be combined with human annotated and human translated data. So if you have a little bit of data in a target language, um, you can combine these to get some clean data and some noisy translated data. Um, the second method that has been proposed recently is to um, embed the utterance tokens using language-specific embedding matrices. Um, and crucially, these embedding matrices have the property that ideally words that um, have similar meaning across languages, have a similar position vector space. And then you can share all the other parameters of the model and you can jointly train the model on um, the high resource and the low resource language. And the third method, um, which is the novel one, um, is to use actually contextual word representations um, that have been trained in a cross-lingual way. So um, the idea here is to combine two lines of research. So the first one is um, if you have, like this is like a caricature of course of an MT system, but if you have a sequence to sequence model um, for translating utterances, then um, Johnson et al. showed that you can easily turn it into a multilingual MT system by just prepending the source utterance with a special token for the target language. And then you can train that in multiple directions and you also do get some zero shot um, learning effects. Um, and yeah, so like if you use a different star token, then you get a different translation. That's the basic idea. Um, the second line of research have been these contextual um, vectors, vector representations, where the idea is um, to train an MT, an MT system and then just um, delete base or like get rid of the decoder and just use the encoder as contextual word representations that can then be um, passed into an NLP task. And so our proposal is to combine these two um, methods. So um, using uh, basically a multilingual version of Cove. So, but instead of actually encoding the target language in the encoder, we encode the target language in the decoder. Um, since we want the encoder to be totally language agnostic and only the decoder to learn then um, in what, what language it has to translate to with the hope that um, that encoder will actually sort of align all the languages into a similar space. And so when we have something like that, um, we can, for example, train an English to French encoder um, and at the same time 
train, um, sorry, an English to French MT model, and at the same time train a uh, French to English MT model. And now the encoder can encode multiple languages. And we again get rid of the decoder, and um, then we just use this encoder as input um, to our slot filling model. And yeah, crucially, as I said, this can then encode multiple languages. So um, we ran a bunch of experiments with these, and like I'm not gonna talk about all of them, like they're even more in the paper, but um, some important ones. So we, um, we ran these baselines where we um, didn't use any external embeddings, and we also ran a baseline where we trained only in a target language, but um, also used these contextual representations to see how much effect we get from the contextual representations versus from transfer learning. And then um, we tried these three different cross-lingual methods. Um, so we tried to translating the training data, the cross-lingual embeddings, and our multilingual cove model. Um, and we evaluate that across four, dom four metrics. Um, domain accuracy, which is just um, getting the, these three domains right. Then intent accuracy, um, getting the intent classification task right. Then frame accuracy, which is the strictest metric. There you have to get the intent, the domain, and all the slots right. Um, so that basically tells you, did, you do a perf did the model do a perfect job on that sentence? Um, and then we also have the slot F1 metric, which is um, just the F1 score on the individual slots. Um, but I'm just gonna report frame accuracy since this is the strictest metric and probably the most informative anyways, um, and to simplify things. So um, let's first look at the results for Thai. Um, so if we just train on the, um, on the Thai data, we actually do get a reasonable performance already, so we get almost 80% frame accuracy. Um, which suggests that our domains weren't too tricky. But we still do get quite a bit of gain if we actually combine that with the contextual board representations. Translating the training data doesn't work at all for Thai, well, I mean, works somewhat, but like much l worse than, um, than um, all the other methods. And that's presumably um, because projecting is very noisy for the English Thai language pair. Um, but crucially, if we actually train on both languages and use these multilingual um, word representations, then we do get a, another gain over just training on the target language data. Um, oops, sorry. And um, we actually don't have the results for the cross-lingual embeddings because we were using the Muse embeddings um, and there aren't any pre-trained embeddings for Thai, unfortunately. Um, for Spanish, we get a very similar picture. So again, um, the adding contextual representations helps. Translating the training data doesn't work as well. Um, we do get quite a boost by training on both English and Spanish and using the multilingual representations. And we do even slightly better if we actually use the static cross-lingual word representations. Um, but then another question we can ask is like, if we even go more extreme and like try actually the zero shot case, what happens then? And interestingly, then the, the picture is kind of reversed. So um, if we translate the training data, we get by far the best results, although they're still not good. They're like around 50% um, um, frame accuracy. If we um, then use these cross-lingual um, embeddings, um, we do get around 10% frame accuracy. And with the static contextual embeddings, we get around 5% frame accuracy. Um, and sort of if we go in between this extreme case and our full data case, we see that um, if we have around 100 utterances per domain for the target language, um, we already outperform the translation baseline. So um, that has been reported before, um, but I guess it's, it's reassuring that this happens here as well. And we do see basically exactly the same pattern for Thai. So, um, let me sum up. So what we saw in our experiments was that cross-lingual training actually consistently outperformed training only on the target language data. Um, we found that the cross-lingual word representations outperformed the translation approach when we had a few hundred training examples. Um, and we found that contextual and static word representations provided similar results. Um, I think actually, so 
we didn't do very thorough hyperparameter tuning of our contextual word representations. So I think there is actually still something to be gained there. Um, but at the moment, at least, um, it seems like the static and the contextual ones give very similar results. Um, and importantly, um, we also release the entire data set. So um, if you're interested in the space, if you want to try new models, um, we provide this data set for you to test on. Thank you. Sorry, can you speak up a little? Um, we have not tried in this work, but I think, um, yeah, especially for Thai, that would presumably be a very good idea, since Thai, like the, the writing system of Thai is actually, doesn't contain spaces. So presumably, like some of the errors the system is making is due to segmentation errors. And um, yeah, I think, um, and I guess given that, like all the success of like, um, of Elmo and Bert and so on, um, I would expect that if we actually used character embeddings as well, we would get an additional boost. Oh. Yeah. Hi, uh, when you use uh, human generated translations, mm -hmm. how do you get the alignments? Um, oh, then you would also have to humanly annotate them. So, um, I mean, I guess you could still like do force decoding with an MT system or so and get the alignments that way. But um, I like it was more on the assumption you actually have some target language data and you also have that annotated and then you can combine that with the noisy machine translation data. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you for speaking. Thanks.